The Sparks Museum podcast is made possible by a grant from the Nevada Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. The podcast is just one of many new features of the Sparks Heritage Museum. To learn more, check out our social media channels or our website at www.sparksmuseum.org. Hello, and welcome to the Sparks Museum podcast. I'm your host and media manager for the Sparks Heritage Museum, Jessica Johnson. The first newspaper in Sparks was the Harriman Herald, which began publications in January of 1904, using the name Harriman, which was the original proposed name for what ultimately became Sparks. The Sparks Headlight followed six months later and is the namesake for the Sparks Heritage Museum's quarterly publication that is sent out to all members. Six months later, the Sparks Dispatch replaced the headlight in January of 1905. Sparks was then briefly without a paper until Patrick H. Mulcahy began publishing the Sparks Tribune in August of 1910. The Tribune continues to serve the community today and can be found producing new content on its online platform. Today on the podcast, we welcome historian, researcher, and performer Frank Mullen, who is currently the editor of the Reno News and Review. After having worked in journalism for over three decades, Frank speaks to the at times painful transition of media from print to digital and how specifically that applies to the news media in the city of Sparks. He also speaks to his favorite stories of the area and gives a fascinating inside look into the world of Chautauqua performance. Without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, Mr. Frank Mullen. coming on the Sparks Museum podcast today. My pleasure. <laughs> so the first question that I'd like to start off, uh, since this is the Sparks Museum podcast, is asking our guests what their personal connection to the city of Sparks is. So what what connection do you have to this city? Well, uh, having worked for the Gazette Journal uh, as a reporter for 25 years, mm -hmm. and also some uh, as an editor for some of that time, uh, had a lot to write about in Sparks. And when, when we first moved here, in 1988, uh, you know, I said, well, S Sparks, is that part of Reno? Is it a suburb? You know, I, I wasn't sure about it. But um, I was told, oh, it's just a bedroom community for Reno. You know, it's, it's and, and obviously I quickly learned Sparks has its own identity and uh, covered a lot of uh, not just special events uh, here, but, uh, uh, you know, a lot of news. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I learned a lot about Sparks over the years. <laughs> And I would love to know a little bit more about your history and your background as both a researcher and a published author. Um, and how did you get involved with the Reno News and Review? Uh, well, I had uh, been in newspapers for 36 years, 25 with the Gazette Journal, and uh, mostly as a writer, although I was an editor at various points in my career. Uh, and uh, retired, well, took the buyout, didn't really want to retire, but the Gazette Journal was buying out the older employees. And if you didn't take it, you'd be laid off in a year anyway without the severance. So uh, pretty much was an easy choice. And um, uh, I had been retired for six years between 2013 and, and the pandemic, or 2014 and the pandemic. And um, when the News and Review went under, when it closed up at the beginning of the pandemic because all its distribution points and uh, advertisers closed down overnight. Uh, it was pretty much dead. Uh, and several weeks, it was, that was it. That was the end of the paper. It had been around for almost 30 years, and that was it. Uh, but then the owners who lived in Sacramento and had been running alternative weeklies since the 1970s, uh, talked to them and they said, well, we've got some pandemic money and uh, could you keep, uh, work for us and keep the News and Review Alive online for a few months until the pandemic is over. <laughs> How optimistic. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and everybody thought like that oh, back yeah. then. You know, I mean, the closure was finite and mm -hmm. people thought, well, this big wave will go through and then we'll be back to normal. But obviously <laughs> not yet. So um, I kept it alive online for about two years. Did 95% uh, of the stories myself because we had no freelance budget. Uh, we held a, a big fundraiser last fall, and then I was able to get freelancers and save myself from going crazy. <laughs> uh, a new owner took over in January, and we went back into print in June uh, 2022, and uh, our July issue came out uh, 
July 1st. So we're two issues into coming back as a print edition. That's excellent. At the same time, the Gazette Journal is pulling back. I wouldn't be surprised by the end of the year if there is no print ish, uh, uh, issue of the Gazette Journal. Wow. Well, on that vein, that we've seen uh, a large shift in the way that uh, newspapers and media as a whole is disseminated to the public. Can you speak a little bit to what you've witnessed during your time working as a journalist and where you kind of see this going? You could just kind of spoke to it of moving to this online sector, but what's lost, do you think, by going solely online instead of also having a print edition? For local news, all is lost, I think, if you go totally internet. Um, different with national news, you got the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times. You have national newspapers. Uh, and uh, so if you're interested in national news, you can go to the Washington Post, the Times, the Journal, wh- whatever, and get a pretty good idea or just get the Associated Press feed and you, you're covered with national news. Uh, but locally, I think local news gets lost in the blizzard of information and uh, of uh, uh, cat videos and, and <laughs> fake news and conspiracy theories and, you know, your neighbor's garden and, you know, there's too much stuff on there. It flies right, you know, across your screen. And occasionally you'll find a Facebook link to a local news story or whatever, but it's very haphazard. Uh, so I miss print newspapers. You, everything was there in one package every day. Uh, and also it was better for advertisers. Uh, people don't see ads on the web. I certainly don't. If you ask me what the last three ads I saw on the web were, I couldn't tell you. Uh, in the Gazette Journal, if you ask me, uh, you read the paper yesterday, a print paper, uh, what advertisers do you remember? I would say, well, uh, you know, the Ford dealership had a double page in the center. Yeah, I'm not interested in buying a car right now, but I did notice that. You know, so you notice it. You may not sit there and read it like it's a novel, but, you know, you, you're there. And uh, online, the ads are just annoying. You know, they pop up, they run across the page, they block what you're looking at. It uh, gets you to hate the advertisers. Absolutely. Uh, and so you lose that. You lose a lot online. And uh, uh, one of the things... Uh, I, having taught at the Reynolds School of Journalism part-time for many years, my students would say, uh, especially over the last 15 dozen years or so, oh, I don't need newspapers. I get all my news on the web, uh, on the Internet. And that's like saying, we don't need farms. I get all my vegetables at Safeway. Why don't they just pave over all those silly farms, you know? And, and it's, that's the web. Uh, somebody writes that stuff you get for free on the web. Somebody researches it. Somebody digs it up. And so uh, information may want to be free on the Internet, but writers and researchers must be paid to make a living. And so when you go to the Internet, the staff at the Gazette Journal in 1988, when I joined the paper, just the newsroom alone, I found the call sheet of emergency numbers, you know, home numbers for everybody recently, 87 names on that call sheet. Now that counted part-time employees and clerks that came in, you know, for sports, uh, agate, what they call it a couple nights a week, but still 87 names, one newsroom. Now you could take the Gazette Journal's newsroom and fit it in a minivan and have room left over for a couple of St. Bernard's. Wow. And so that's the loss. Uh, You cannot support a news gathering organization locally on the internet. It just cannot be done. There's no business model for it. So if you've got a newsroom with, uh, you know, say the news review, eight people at one point in their newsroom years ago, uh, and you go totally online, you've got enough revenue for one person. Wow. If you're lucky uh, and probably not even that. Uh, and so ads on the internet are pennies ads on, Newsprint on uh, a physical paper, thousands of dollars, and that's the loss. You you can you can't do it locally. You just can't. Uh, newspaper companies are pretending to do it uh, all over. They've a lot of them have closed their print, print editions up completely, and they're going online. But those are stories generated from two hundred miles away from where people are. You know, from where you're supposed to be covering. You know, uh, uh, 
the operations are getting thinner and thinner and thinner and, and a lot of press releases and filler. And uh, uh, it, it's really a great loss for local news and for communities. And related to this idea as well, I, I think that it's interesting to have you as a guest here as someone who's worked in the news, which is very much about what's going on right now at the moment, and also the side of your um, history and your career that is based in research as well. And seeing as Sparks Heritage Museum is a historical institution with an archive, we've been building a research library that has been offered in the past stored volumes of other local print publications that we sadly haven't been able to take on ourselves just because of a lack of space. Mm -hmm. Um, But thankfully, a lot of these materials are accessible via online sources such as newspapers.com and other online archives. So in your experience working with the Reno Gazette and since then, what resources do you use for your research? Was there an archive that you, that was a go-to? And I think in a larger sense, what do you think is the long-term impact of historic preservation of these items? Uh, In terms of research, when I was at the Gazette Journal, um, we had uh, what all newspapers had, clip files. We had a team of librarians, three or four librarians every day who would use a pair of scissors and cut stories out of the paper and put them into various envelopes. Uh, and not just one story, one envelope, one topic. Uh, for example, uh, the nugget in Sparks. You get a story about the nugget, a copy would go into John Esquaga's file, a copy would go into the nugget's file, a copy would go if there was a city council action in the city council's file. Uh, If it had something to do with I-80 and the nugget, it would also go in the NDOT, the Department of Transportation file. And that clip library, that physical paper library of things in envelopes, within minutes I could find out the history of anything going back to the 1870s. Mm. Literally within minutes because it was indexed. There were index cards. There were uh, various drawers and a filing system. And you'd go in and say, I need the Mustang Ranch history. And you find it in the Mustang Ranch file, and then there'd be a, another file for Joe Conforti, who used to own it, and, you know, back and forth brothels, it, a main file for them, you know, and, and you would have a stack of research on your desk, and it was wonderful. Newspapers.com, incomplete, huge holes in it. For the last two years, I've had to look up my own stories for reference when I'm doing stories. Uh, for example, the uh, Fallon Naval Air Station wants more land. Well, that ended the first time they wanted their bombing target to be a lot bigger because they keep missing. Uh, But uh, I covered that from the early 90s all the way up through here, so I know I've written stories on it. Uh, Fallon's not a good keyword. Too many hits. Mm. Naval, no way. Fallon Naval Air Station, yeah, with with quotes, 10,000 stories. I want this particular aspect of it, not every story ever written. So it takes you a long time to find stuff unless you're really, really sharp on keywords and remember what might be unique in that particular story. And then a lot of times I'll call up my own stories. It'll start off on page one. I'll go through newspapers.com, which is just a digitized microfiche system. And it'll say jumps to page 8A and I'll go to page 8A and there's an ad. And I'll realize it's the same ad that's on page 7A Whoever scanned that or whoever did the microfiche in the first place made a mistake. Mm. And just in my small sampling of stories written by me, I found that happened three, four times in the last two years, randomly looking for stories. So people say, oh, digital, it's forever. It's more ephemeral than paper. I, it is. Medium changes, uh, different types of storage, uh, media change over the years. Uh, servers go dead and the and the information is never passed over. So I think digital, for future librarians and researchers, digital is going to be a disaster mm. uh, beca- without a paper backup. And there's no, like you said, there's no place to keep all that paper. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, that is a problem. But uh, for me as a researcher, the internet's great because you can find stuff there without having to travel to St. Louis and go through the military archives there. Uh, and, and that's terrific, that remote access. But for local stuff, we lose a lot when it goes digital. 
Uh, the Gazette Journal alone had a nine-month black hole in their own archival system, which no longer exists either, by the way. They're totally dependent on newspaper.com now. But when we had a digital archive, when they got rid of the human librarians and the digital library took over, there was a nine-month gap in which no stories were kept either physically in print or digitally in on the server. So they were on the, on the microfiche archives. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's... People have the wrong idea about digital, that it's this, you know, panacea for information storage and retrieval. In a lot of ways it is, but over the long term, we're going to lose decades of information, and uh, uh, you really can't rely on it. This digital versus physical uh, debate is an ongoing subject, not just in the media realm, but across a lot of different mediums as well between literature, between film and television. Um, and I think that that is what makes you a perfect guest to speak to this, especially with what you've just gone through over the past two years with the uh, Reno News and Review. And it relates perfectly, even though they've been mostly Reno focused during this podcast, it relates perfectly to the city of Sparks because the city of Sparks has the Sparks Tribune, which began in 1910, but has since mm-hmm. moved to a solely online format. The museum itself actually has one of the presses that the original Sparks Tribune used. But we had we have a lot of people in the community reminiscing about the loss of the Sparks Tribune. And even though it's still a resource that can be used, there is there is something lost about the move to the digital realm and also, I think, a lack of interpersonal connection to the community. That's, I absolutely agree. Uh, a newspaper, a small town newspaper, and those are the ones that were first to disappear, uh, particularly when they were bought out by giant corporations and then bled to death and their real estate sold and the corporation moves on and the community is left without a voice. But, uh, yeah, it's, it, there's a whole sense of community that goes along with having a, a, a town paper. Uh, even though uh, Sparks is, was served by the Reno Gazette Journal, the, having its own voice uh, since the turn of the, of the 20th century was super important. And they still have that voice online, but it's diluted. I, I used to read the Sparks Tribune all the time because I would come across it. Uh, in various places around Sparks and Reno. Uh, I have to go and find it now and see what's on there. And the only reason I know it's online now is because of Andy Barbano's column, uh, (laughs) Barb Wire. I I will seek it out to read Andy's column. But, uh, and and so I will see what else is on there at the same time. But uh, yeah, tremendous loss when uh, you lose that small town voice, you lose that focus of a, uh, of a local paper, and and uh, online just doesn't cut it. Uh, I'm glad they're surviving, but it's so much more effective. And and of course, I'm a dinosaur. I I prefer <laughs> print. Sure. Uh, I like holding printed books in my hand. I do not own a Kindle. Uh, uh, Susan, my wife, does. She loves it. She reads on it all the time. But I can't. I read so much stuff on screens, doing research and stuff. When I read a book, I want a book an actual book with pages and covers and, uh, uh, you know, use a bookmark to keep your place. And, uh, uh, but I'm a dying breed. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't, I think the digital revolution has had a lot of benefits, but it's also hurt uh, a lot of things, particularly at the local level. And as a journalist and a researcher, these, these two parts of your life, are there stories that you're aware of about the city of Sparks that either haven't been told yet or have been lost to time that you feel are worth revisiting? Well, uh, there are so many things, you know, feature story, birth of the elephant, you know, uh, things like that that people forget about. A lot of right. nostalgic things going on with Sparks. Uh, but also in terms of the history of the community, Obviously, Victorian Square, you've got the museum there, you've got the train, the the locomotives and the train cars, harken back to uh, the real city's birth. Uh, But having done a lot of local history about the whole valley, uh, one of my favorite places in Sparks, which I I just passed today uh, on the way here, 
is the interchange of I-80 and Vista. Now, you might say, yeah, it's a bunch of concrete. So what? Well, there was a fishing village there for 4,000 years. Uh, it was in its heyday between 500 and 1400 A.D. Oh, my gosh. Uh, these were uh, the ancestors of uh, the Washoe tribe today, the Washoe uh, people. And uh, they, they fished there uh, every season with gill nets. They caught uh, uh, kiwi and chub and the hot and cups or trout. It was this thriving village for 4,000 years, it's seasonal usually, and it was in most of its use between 500 and 1400 uh, A.D. But things like that, you know, that uh, I've, I've written about and researched, and you drive by there today and it's just a bunch of concrete and asphalt. But in my mind's eye, I see that village every time I go through that interchange. And the river, that's because it was on the river. Uh, the river has meandered in the, in the millennia. And so the river is now, what, 550 yards uh, away from, uh, uh, but would be south, I guess, of the, of the interchange. But things like that, that uh, you really have to dig into research to know even existed. And, and uh, one of the lessons I've learned as a historian that it doesn't, you know, whatever is here now, is just a glimpse of just a tidy snapshot of that place. And you really need to look at the whole timeline uh, as to what occurred, uh, you know, before you arrived on the scene. That is so true. And I think that these are part of those ideas of stories that are worth telling so that those memories aren't forgotten. That history isn't forgotten. On that note, you are a published author and a researcher, and is it correct that you have over 10 Chautauqua characters? Yes, yeah, I have about a dozen wow. Chautauqua characters since 1998 to the present. Now, for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with Chautauqua, could you give a brief background on how that came about and also what goes into the preparation of a Chautauqua performance? Uh, Chautauqua performances have to do with someone, generally a scholar, who has studied a particular historical character for a long period of time, uh, taking on the personality of that character. Uh, one of the big examples locally is uh, Clay Jenkinson, who used to be at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, doing Thomas Jefferson. He appeared at the White House twice doing Jefferson. Wow. Uh, and uh, he had a, his own radio program on NPR, the Jeff Thomas Jefferson Hour. Uh, but anyway, he would take on the personality of Jefferson, and he knew everything that was to know about the, you know, his biography, and be, just live in Jefferson's skin for 40 minutes and do a monologue of uh, uh, his life and times. And then you, you break, and then the audience is asked to provide questions to the character uh, from within that character's time. You can't say, uh, can't ask Babe Ruth what he thinks of, uh, you know, some modern baseball player, because he's, he's Never heard of him. You can ask him what he what he thought of uh, uh, Lou Gehrig. Uh, you can ask him what things from his own time. You can't ask him when did you die, because you are supposed to be that character, and the character would not necessarily know. Right. Uh, but uh, so then, after about fifteen minutes of questions, you come out of character, and the audience can ask you questions as the scholar, like when did your character die, or how hard was it to research or whatever. Uh, and so I've done a lot of characters in the last 20 some odd years, uh, Henry VIII, Albert Einstein, uh, Dan DeQuill, who was a Nevada author uh, and a journalist who lived, uh, he was Mark Twain's roommate. Uh, wow. Twain was up in Virginia City and Twain went become uh, world famous and DeQuill stayed there 30 years as a newspaper man. Uh, and so I've done a lot of different characters and the way that I developed them uh, I was always working full-time and teaching part-time during the course of developing these characters. And so it, I'd give myself a year. Once we decided on the theme of the Reno Chautauqua, uh, let's say it was uh, the Renaissance, and uh, I decided to be Henry VIII, I start researching about a year in advance and read all the biographies of Henry, read biographies of his six wives, uh, I would uh, look at the uh, British Library online, you know, 
do some online research uh, at the British Museum and and the British uh, 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 the BBC Library and the, and the historical libraries there. Uh, and there, that was some of the first podcasts I ever listened to. By the way, the British Museum on one of the anniversaries of Henry's reign wow. had a whole series of podcasts, uh, which were great. And um, and they played some of the music he uh, uh, he composed and some of his poems, and so you could hear them in you know the speech of Tudor England. Uh, but so basically, you want to find out everything you can about the character and develop that monologue. Fitting a person's life in forty minutes isn't going to happen. So you want to tell the story uh, in a way that people can relate to. Uh, in Henry's case, and I just did him, uh, performed as him about a month ago in Douglas County, so he's you know fresh in my mind. Uh, but in his case, he sticks to the story of the six wives, which is really the story of his uh, overriding ambition for a male heir. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, in the course of that, you tell Henry's uh, life story. Uh, and the same thing with, you know, Babe Ruth. Uh, Chautauqua is basically, you don't try to get the whole life story in 40 minutes, but you want to get the highlights in, and it's really like a bunch of stories strung together like beads. Uh, you know, Henry telling the story of six wives. There were six takes in that monologue. Uh, and then, you know, when I get to Jane uh, Seymour, I can also talk about the sacking of the monasteries because Jane did not like that. Uh, that they would steal all the all the possessions of the Catholic Church when Henry went, you know, created his own Church of England, uh, and and so each wife uh, also has things that went on around that time, you know, that I could tell stories about, and uh, it's a lot of fun. When Chautauqua began, the the modern Chautauqua movement in the seventies was generally uh, PhDs who had studied, say, Harry Truman and written two, three books about Harry Truman, and then they would play Harry uh, uh, in Chautauqua. Uh, and uh, when I started doing it, I remember there was quite a lot of, uh, some newspaper guy is going to do, you know, <laughs> he's not a PhD. He's never written a book about Babe Ruth or whoever, I'm, Albert Einstein. I mean, there, there's a big character. Uh, so... Uh, uh, but gradually there was some, you know, acceptance in it, especially because... I, Spending a year on something, you're going to learn a lot. And uh, part of it is trying to get that into a form that people will buy into and appreciate and be entertained by, too. It's not a lecture. It's not a college academic lecture. It is you're walking in on this character's life and uh, at some point, and they are telling you their story from their point of view. One of the characters I do is Benedict Arnold. When he gets up on stage, he is not a vile traitor. Mm. He thinks he is right. He did the right thing uh, all those years ago. And, and he is adamant that, you know, he got screwed. And by God, his, his reaction was perfectly appropriate. And, you know, and, and uh, he defends himself to the hilt. Uh, so you're speaking as the character. Uh, and I guess Arnold is probably... Arnold and Henry VIII are probably the two most notorious characters I, I do, but a lot of times uh, they're heroic as well. Edward, Edward R. Morrow, Albert Einstein, Babe Ruth, uh, U.S. Grant, mm. uh, I, I do, uh, Dan DeQuill, John C. Fremont, another one that related to the local area. I'm doing one uh, coming up at uh, Donner Museum uh, rather quickly. Uh, Caleb Greenwood, who was a trapper, uh, a mountain man, born during the revolution, died during the gold rush, led the first wagons through this valley, through the Truckee Meadows in 1844, and over Donner Pass, opening the California Trail, or the Truckee route of the California Trail. Wow. In 1844, two years later, Donner's traveled it. Caleb and his sons assisted in the rescue of the survivors. So he's kind of a pivotal uh, character. So I think the thing with Chautauqua is you have to be excited about these characters. You can't just like, I'm doing a book report on Thomas Jefferson. 
oh no, you know. Uh, and and uh, that's what I, I tell young Chautauquans, you know, pick a character you're really interested in, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, somebody who invented the character of Superman, you know, and yeah. really into that, or uh, a local personage or whatever. Pick someone that you're really interested in, and you don't have to like him. I don't like Benedict Arnold. I, I admire him. He was the greatest general of, of the revolution, really. But uh, uh, he wa he was a traitor, uh, and and you don't have to like them. You just have to be interested in them, and then be willing to take their side, no matter what it is. Well, and I thinking about that, uh, especially with characters like you said, the the well known controversial gentleman like Henry VIII or Benedict Arnold. You have the audience coming in with a preconceived notion of how they should feel about these characters. Do you often find in the Q&As afterwards that you've either changed their perspective or given them something that they might otherwise not have known about? I always try to do that. Uh, for example, Albert Einstein. I mean, he's known as a grandfatherly, quiet, funny uh, figure. The newsreels I've seen of him, and there were a lot of newsreels. They, he was the first scientist, I think, that transcended science. He was like Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was a baseball player, but people that had never seen a baseball game in their lives knew who Babe Ruth was. Uh, and the same with Einstein. You didn't have to know anything about the science. To, to a real smart guy, you know, grandfatherly smart guy. Um, Einstein had a negative side to him. He abandoned uh, his first child, uh, Lucero, uh, who was born out of wedlock, because uh, when he was living in Switzerland at the time, and it wouldn't look good to have a kid out of wedlock, even though he eventually married uh, the, the child's mother. She, she was Einstein's first wife. Uh, but uh, uh, he abandoned this kid, and, and he was also a philanderer. He, he uh, was not a good guy to be married to. Uh, he used his fame. Um, and uh, so there are things about the general impressions of characters. Uh, Henry VIII. Uh, the opposite. He's known as a tyrant. He's known as a serial matrimonialist. Uh, he's known as a glutton. Uh, you know, you throw the chicken bone over your shoulder and, you know, wipe your uh, uh, mouth with a jeweled uh, doublet, you know, and throw it away. And uh, But when Henry uh, became king, he was 17 years old when his dad died, uh, he married the 23-year-old Catherine of Aragon, and the two of them brought the Renaissance to England. They were intelligent, well-educated, athletic. Uh, it was the power couple of the time. It was, uh, in American history, kind of like when the Kennedys came in in 1960. They were young, they were vibrant, they had new ideas, they were fashionable, they set the fashion trend. They, you know, there was so much, uh, you know, such a, a, a refreshing change, and that's the way it was with Henry VIII for the first 20 years of his reign. You know, he was a good king. And because of the problem he had in finding an heir, a male heir, uh, he deteriorated. And, and everything comes from that, his, his uh, repeated weddings and, and uh, uh, all the negative things we know about him stem from that. But for 20 years, he was, uh, he and Catherine Aragon were the power couple, the Kennedys of, of, of England. As someone who's done Youth Chautauqua myself, I think that that right there is what makes Chautauqua so compelling as well, is this blend of historical research and then also your role as a storyteller of crafting that story and kind of making it apparent to the audience how greed and power can corrupt uh, in, in Henry VIII's case. Um, but in some of your more local characters, like you were talking about DeQuill and Fremont and Greenwood, was it? Caleb Greenwood, Greenwood. Yes. Um what what resources do you utilize that are local to this area? Are there local archives that you use? Any any newspaper archives that you have been useful in your research? Uh, the uh, Nevada Historical Society and also the Special Collections Library at the University of Nevada Reno. Uh, in the case of DeQuill, very few of his articles have survived. The the uh, uh, territorial enterprise is not on newspapers.com. Mm. They were too hard to, so a lot of that is paper copies. You've got to go to the Historical Society and, and look at the paper. Um, they aren't scanned in. There was no microfiche option. 
newspapers.com gets digitized as microfiche, but uh, I, I don't think the territorial enterprise is on microfiche, and if it is, it hasn't been digitized yet. Uh, so uh, it's it's more on the ground kind of research for uh, those folks. And like when I did U.S. Grant, uh, Grant visited Nevada after his presidency. He went around the world with his wife, uh, Julia, and then he went to Nevada. Uh, at, at, uh, well, on, on the way back from going around the world, he stopped in Nevada. And um, uh, I got all the newspaper accounts of, of his visit and uh, so when I do Grant in Nevada, I spend more time than I would if I'm doing him in Missouri. I wouldn't even mention his visits sure. to Nevada. But uh, uh, so looking at those local angles. Uh, in Caleb Greenwood's case, uh, and also the Donner Party's case, finding the trail, going back and looking at the early surveys in the 18, uh, late 1860s, early 1870s of the area, looking for the remnants of the trails, uh, looking at the Hagstrom fire atlases to see what Reno looked like and Sparks looked like uh, going back over the years. Those fire atlases were done for fire insurance purposes, wooden structure, brick structure, whatever, but they are gold mines of history because they show what was in a certain spot going back more than 100 years, you know, on a certain street corner and whatever, and they're just wonderful resources. And there's a lot of resources like that that weren't, particularly created to help future historians, but do. It's my understanding as well with what I know about Chautauqua was that a lot of either historical institutions from around the country or in some cases the world or um, places that have a particular theme around a historical figure can hire, can search for Chautauquans to come and do a performance at a special event. Have you been invited to any far off locale for any of your Chautauquas? I was almost, I, I got very close to doing Grant at the, uh, at West Point. Wow. Uh, and what happened was the commandant who was interested in that later, you know, he retired, it was right before the pandemic and everything was wacky, but uh, a friend of mine, uh, from when I was a kid, uh, attended West Point. He was friends with the current commandant. And when he found out I was doing Chautauqua and Grant was one of my characters, he talked to his old buddy about it. Let's get him in here, you know. And that would have been like playing Babe Ruth at Cooperstown. You know, that would have been kind of scary because when I do Grant, I'm not doing it in front of a, a bunch of military historians. And the faculty at West Point certainly knows more about Grant than I do. Sure. Even though I've read everything. Uh, they you know, no considerably more. Uh, that also would have been a good venue for Benedict Arnold is considering he tried to sell West Point to the British in uh, uh, 17, what was it? 1780, uh, 1779, 1780, but whatever, uh, that was his act of treason. He was going to turn over the main fort on the Hudson to the British and end the war uh, right there and then with one fell swoop. Uh, but uh, I've done Fremont all up and down his trail. Uh, he was all over the West, and I've done Fremont all over the West. And when I do, I try to focus. If I'm in Missouri, I focus on his uh, marriage to uh, Jesse Benton uh, and his actions there during the war and his court martial. When I'm in the West, I talk about his trail work. You know, so it's very flexible uh, in terms of the character, especially one as well traveled as Fremont uh, or Caleb Greenwood for that matter, same thing. If I'm talking uh, to an audience in Nebraska, I'm talking about uh, the Platte River Trail and I'm talking about the South Pass and getting over the Rockies and Beaver and stuff like that. And if I'm t out here, I'd be talking about the rescue of the Donner Party and the opening of the trail over Donner Pass. I think that's so impactful too that, that depending on the physical geography of where you are, the story gets customized. And I think it makes it even more important that you be a, a certified expert, as it were, in your character so that you can speak to those specific aspects of that historical figure. Yeah, and a lot of the characters are interrelated. Uh, Fremont, uh, Caleb Greenwood, uh, Dandy Quill, you know, local people who have maybe not crossed paths in time, but crossed paths in geography and history. Certainly. And kind of a final thought on uh, Chautauqua, um, you spoke about speaking to youth Chautauqua. 
What do you think are the greatest benefits to taking the time to research, embody, and present a character, or even just viewing a Chautauqua as an audience member? Uh, I think for the performer, it's enriching in terms of learning about anyone's, uh, as, as human beings, everything about other human beings is, is not foreign to us. And so learning about other people's lives and the challenges they face, it, it is the benefits of biography, really. And uh, also, in terms of audience, it is also enriching because you learn about the character in a way that is not an academic lecture or reading a textbook. Uh, it's stories. And so when I get up to do Einstein, for example, I'll start out, uh, the audience is going to clap wildly because it's Albert. <laughs> uh, and I don't look like Einstein, but I, I grow my hair long and I put the white Halloween uh, coloring in it <laughs> and I grow my mustache very bushy and I put the white in there. And uh, first time I did Einstein, I did a lot of makeup. Uh, a makeup artist worked on me because he's got the most recognizable face in the universe. <laughs> uh, but afterwards I realized it's all about the hair and the mustache and the accent. You know, and yeah. uh, when I do Einstein, I come out and I say, uh, you know, people clap wildly. And I, I say, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm always amazed at the reception I receive from strangers. And then I go into a story about how he and Charlie Chaplin went to a film opening in uh, the 1930s or, or maybe it was late 20s. So I haven't done him in a while. I would have to look up all the dates. But anyway they get to the film opening and people go crazy because they see Charlie Chaplin and Albert Einstein, who they know from the newspapers in the car. And they start pounding on the side of the car and, and say, Einstein, Einstein, Einstein. And of course to Einstein, who is a refugee from Nazi Germany, this looks an awful lot like Nuremberg and he's scared. And he turns to, uh, uh, to Chaplin and he says, or oh, this adulation, they don't even know me, all this adulation, what does it mean? And Charlie, who knew, said nothing, oh. nothing. And then Albert has a chance to tell that story. Wow. And then say, it's true. I am famous for something that no one understands, <laughs> relativity. And then he goes into relativity. So it's all these stories that are just strung together and uh, quite painless way to learn history, really. Uh, and uh, that's what I love about it. Uh, and I especially like the Q&As. You never know what they're going to ask. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times there are stumpers in there. And uh, so you've got to find ways to not look dumb in terms of if someone asks a question your character would definitely have known and you don't know the answer to it. You've got to find a way to wiggle out of it instead of just saying, I don't know. Yeah. Um, as, as you know, as a performer, you, you got to keep up that persona and uh, you don't want to break character. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for bringing Albert here. I feel like when I go back and record the introduction, I need to introduce both of you. <laughs> well, I think this is the perfect jumping off point to get into our final big three questions. Oh, okay. These are questions that we ask each one of our guests. Um, and so the first question is, what sparks you about Sparks? What do you think makes it an interesting place to visit or live or work? Uh, I think it's, it's kind of a small town within a bigger town. Uh, you get something, you get the Rib Festival, these other special events. You get Hot August Nights events that are unique to Sparks uh, every year. Uh, Sparks Hometown Christmas. I mean, there's a example of something you would see in small town America uh, everywhere. And yet you've got a fairly large, relatively large metropolitan area, but within it is this small town. And, th and that's what I like about Sparks. And do you have a favorite story or moment from Sparks' history? This could, I mean, you have done copious amounts of research in your career, so more than likely this is going to be a significant historical moment, but it very well could be a personal memory that you have of an event that you witnessed in this area or something no noteworthy that you were a part of in reporting. Well, when you, in, in my case as a journalist and as a historian, 
especially having been here more than 30 years, throughout the Truckee Meadows, just about every street corner has a story. Mm-hmm. You know, I've done so many of them. And, uh, uh, and as a historian as well, I mentioned the, the uh, interchange, uh, I-80 and Vista interchange, seeing that fishing village uh, of indigenous people that had been there for millennia. Uh, and the same thing with the railroads here. And, and uh, then individual stories, you know, crimes. You know, I'll drive by a street corner, and to everybody else is a street corner, and I'll be like, this was a crime scene. <laughs> you know, and and because so, so there are ghosts everywhere, and and uh, uh, not just in Sparks, but throughout the Truckee Meadows. Uh, uh, I will be in an area, uh, you know, over by the sewer plant, and envision the the uh, not just that old fishing village, but the first trading post there, uh, and things like that. So uh, I see the wagons coming in uh, off Truckee River Canyon in my mind's eye. So it's all interwoven after all this time of telling stories about the area. Uh, all the stories come together everywhere I go in, in my mind's eye. And our final question, um, since this is the Sparks Museum podcast uh, and we are in the active process of building a research center and we have an active archive collection that is constantly looking for more materials and stories that we believe are absolutely worth sharing around the Sparks and Truckee Meadows region. I was wondering if there was one thing that you could add to the Sparks Museum archive. Um, This could either be something that you own or something that you're just aware about or have seen in the past. What would you put in a museum? And even though you don't have to donate it, we would happily take Uh, it off your hands. Okay. (laughs) Uh, I think... uh, some wood from the Donner Party Murphy cabin. Oh, wow. Uh, I've got uh, some a couple of vials of it to build that big monument up there, uh, the, the heroic monument on the 22-foot tall base uh, that's up at Donner Memorial. The uh, first biographer of the Donner Party, C.F. McGlashan, was a Truckee newspaper editor, took the last board of that cabin, which was the threshold, the board that was under what served as the open door of the Murphy cabin Mm. uh, up at the lake. Uh, And he took that and he ground the board down into little splinters and then had blown glass vials made and put some of the wood into each vial and then sold them for a dollar a piece to help finance the monument that's there now. And uh, when I was doing research for the Donner Party, I came across several of these, and I've given a few away. I gave one to Marilyn Newton, the photographer uh, of the uh, uh, of my book on the Donner Party, and I, I've given a couple to descendants of the Donner families, but I've got a couple left, and I think one of those needs to be uh, in the Sparks Museum. And it's 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 got provenance, it's got Mr. McGlashan's signature on a little tag, and it's numbered. They had like 4,000 vials, I guess. So wow. it's one of 4,000 some odd vials. Uh, but I think that would be an artifact that needs to be in a museum and not, you know, with my personal effects. And after I'm gone, you know, a niece or a nephew goes, what the hell is this? You know, throws it away. <laughs> and what they should do is put it in a drawer and then their kid can bring it to Antiques Roadshow. But, uh, you know, if, if that's still on. But I, I think that would be a, a good addition to the collection. Wow. That is absolutely incredible. I'd never heard of that. And, and yeah, the, the, the Donner story is so essential to the story of this entire region of the migration and the strife. And I think, I think that that's, Fantastic. What a cool story. And thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing oh, my with pleasure. us thank you, all of these excellent stories. And uh, we look forward to more. Can't wait to see what's next with the Reno News and Review. So glad that you're back in print. Yeah, well, if the advertisers help out, and I know they're all tightening their belts, the pandemic wiped out many businesses, and the ones that are left standing uh, are still struggling. And so it's an uphill battle to try to get enough advertising for us to sustain it. Nobody's trying to make a lot of money. Quite frankly, we'd be happy to break even. Right. But we can't lose money. I mean, we're losing money on it now. Mm. Not me. I'm, I'm a paid help. But uh, Jimmy Vogel, the new owner, is uh, he told me losing four grand a month on it. Mm. 
mm. now uh, as you know a print edition. And so we're hoping to get out of that hole and at least make it sustainable. And if someone was interested in advertising with the Reno News and Review, who should they contact? Uh, well, it's uh, online. Uh, if you, you all the contact information is there. If you just put in Reno News and Review in Google, that'll get you to the page. And then the page has buttons for you know if you're interested in ads or readers can donate or whatever. Uh, so we no longer have a local office. My basement has served as the newspaper office for the last two years, um, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens. But I. I put a lot of work into it and I'm, I'm going to see it through and hope that the print edition will be able to sustain itself. And then I want to take a step back, do some investigative stories, but not the editor anymore. I've got a book projects and stuff I need to get back to. Oh, I yeah. really, I had a 40 year career and I didn't mean to come out of retirement and start another 40 year career <laughs> in the <laughs> same business. Uh, but uh, it was needed. And, uh, Glad to step up, and uh, it actually was a good way to spend the height of the pandemic because had I been sitting home watching Netflix or something, I would have been bored to tears, but having to go out and cover stories during that period, like I, as I did my whole career, was great. Wow. Well, I can't wait to see what's next. And once again, thank you so much for being on the podcast my today. My pleasure. Thank you. Sparks Museum podcast is funded in part by a grant from the Nevada Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is produced and recorded at the podcast recording studio at Sparks' own Ant Space Coworking Entrepreneurial Hub, a place for entrepreneurs made by entrepreneurs. We really want to get the word out about our brand new audio series, so please spread the word about our new podcast by taking a moment to rate, review, and share this episode. Do you have a favorite story of Sparks that you want to hear on the podcast? Email info at sparksmuseum.org to share any recommendations. We would love to hear from you. We also invite you to visit the Sparks Heritage Museum on 814 Victorian Avenue. The museum is open Tuesdays through Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Please come visit and be a part of our ongoing efforts to tell the Sparks story. We'll see you next time.